uh, the sweeter uh, Jesus becomes. And I don't know when all of you started your pilgrimage on uh, your journey of the Christian faith, your journey, your walk with Jesus, but I do pray, I do hope that that is your experience, that uh, the longer you have been with him, the sweeter and more precious Jesus becomes to you. Um, we are going, uh, if you have your Bibles, please turn to Romans chapter 8 uh, this morning. I'm going to read verses 18 to 30. Uh, we've been in these, uh, uh, this, uh, in this section for, for several weeks, going slowly through it, but I think on purpose, so that you will know uh, the depth of our assurance in the midst of our suffering, and the, uh, the depth of God's grace and his promises that he has given to us. And so in Romans chapter 8, um, 18 to 30, and we will focus on uh, verses 29 to 30 uh, today to conclude that, this section here. <clears throat> we read, For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts and knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we worship you this morning, and we praise you for the tremendous grace that you have given to us in the gospel. We praise you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who became one of us, who died on behalf of us, who rose again and is at your right hand in the heavenly realms. And Lord, we praise you for the grace that you have given to us in making us alive in him and seating us in the heavenly realms in Christ. Now, O Lord, as we uh, probe the depths of your grace this morning, I pray that you will fill me with your Holy Spirit, and you will be my strength and weakness, Lord, for the glory and praise of your name. Amen. Amen. While there are many deep places in the world, one might think of caves that one goes spelunking, I guess that is the term, in and goes into the depths of the earth a mile or so downward. One might explore the Mariana Trench, um, which is the deepest part of the ocean, some, I think it is two miles deep. And often I wanted to throw my cell phone in the Mariana Trench, only to be rid of it. But there are other deep places in the world and in the universe that you might know of. We can see into the, uh, the fringes of our universe, but there are depths of space that we have yet to even begin to explore. And yet, if we consider our own souls, our own hearts, there is a deepness, there is a, a depth to our own souls that even we ourselves don't fully grasp or understand why we do the things that we do. These are deep places, these are deep things. But oh, when we come to the glory and majesty of God, 
and try to probe him, try to sound forth his depth. He is immense, he is infinite, and though we can plumb as far as we can, we can never quite grasp it. And so we begin this morning to, be, to probe the depths of God's grace to us. Now last week we explored the very rich promise that God works all things for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And this is set in the context of suffering. You might remember that Paul made the daring claim, his bold thesis statement on suffering when he said, for I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. What do you mean that there is greater glory than my present sufferings? And Paul then goes on to say how creation has sighed and groaned waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. We as Christians sigh and groan, waiting for the redemption of our bodies. The Spirit himself sighs and groans, interceding on our behalf towards God the Father, and we know that those prayers will be answered. And so when the apostle comes to the promise in verse 28 that God works all things for good to his people, he roots it and he grounds it in the knowledge of God's eternal purpose and salvation. He roots it in the depths of God's grace. Now, these two verses that we will look at, I admit, have a lot of big words, but they have big and infinite and immense concepts that probe the depths of God. Yet these big words form what many have called a golden chain that links our present salvation to what God has done already in the past. And it answers the question, how do we know that God will work all things together for our eternal good? And the answer is that God leads his people along this golden chain that no force in heaven or hell can sever. He guides us along this path of salvation, this path of grace that no one can snatch us from or lead us astray from, or sway us off, no matter how great the temptation might be. Because he who began this process before creation will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So let us begin by looking back on God's eternal purpose plan. Look back at his God's eternal purpose plan. We read in verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Now in the midst of our trials, in the midst of our sufferings, in the midst of our pain and sicknesses and cancers, in the midst of losing loved ones as many of us have experienced over the past few weeks, God's word beckons us to look at this golden chain, to look back and see uh, God's salvation. Now the first link of this chain is that God foreknew his people. Well, what does it mean that he foreknew his people? Now, we have to realize that the Apostle Paul had the Old Testament's understanding of the word no. And if you look back in the Old Testament, you will see that this word no has the nuance of love. Adam knew his wife Eve, and so on. There are many other places. And so, therefore, when God foreknew his people, it means that he thought of them in a loving relationship yeah. with himself before creation even began. And if you are a Christian this morning, ponder this. That before the mountains rose out of the seas, before God scattered the stars in the heavens, before God even said, let there be light, He foreknew you. He saw you in a loving relationship with Himself. Christopher Ash put it this way, long before a Christian knows God, God has known him or her and entered in anticipation into relationship. God had, has fixed His mind upon you in eternity past. Before you even existed, God set his heart, his affection upon you. 
Not because he saw your decision for Christ. Not because he saw the good works that would ensue. No, he who saw you. He saw you lost in your sins. He saw you dead in your transgressions and sins. And thought of you in terms of his infinite grace. God fixed his heart upon you in infinite grace. Is this not an incredible thought? Before the foundation of the world, God thought of you in relationship to himself. He knew the time and place you would be born. He knew that you would be under the dominion of sin, and yet he sent his son to rescue you. An Old Testament example of this is Jeremiah. God tells Jeremiah in a very tender moment in his calling, Jeremiah chapter 1, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, he tells Jeremiah. Centuries before Jeremiah even existed, before time began, God knew him. God knew him. And Jeremiah needed to know that from what he had to preach and what he had to experience. That underneath him was the everlasting arms. That underneath him was God's knowledge of him. And while all illustrations break down at this point, we might liken it to when a good parents have children. Well, all of our children were in womb. Grace and I loved them. We didn't know anything about them yet. We might have seen them on the computer screen, but we didn't know their temperament. We didn't know what they would be like. We didn't know even whether they were a boy or girl. We are perhaps one of the few parents that, that still want to be surprised when they come out, but we still loved them. We didn't know the tiresome days, or the fussy days, or the silly moments, or the, the great times we would have, but we loved them. Now, again, all illustrations break down, but God looked out and he saw you. He loved you. He knew you. He knew your DNA. He knew your temperament. He knew you would be in sin, but he knew you. Perhaps we could, we could uh, describe it in another way. Uh, that um, when an architect and builder has in mind a house that he wants to build, it's in his mind's heart, it's in his mind's eye, this image of a house, this house that he wants to be built. Well, God's eternal purpose moves on to the next link of the golden chain, predestination. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. He predestined his people, that is, he destined them before the creation of the world. He decided on you before you decided on him. He decided on you even though you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And he said, aha, that one there, she is mine. That one there, he is mine. Not because of anything that we have done, not because of our righteous deeds, but he knew us beforehand. He did not have plan A, and then all of a sudden say, oh no, things got messed up. Oh no, what am I going to do? I have to go to plan B. I have to go to plan C. No, he saw it all beforehand. He knew what would happen and when it would happen. And it reminds us of God's unfathomable grace, his infinite grace, his immense grace, his unshakable grace, the majesty and mystery of God's grace toward us, that he looked out and he saw us in love. He looked out and he predestined us. You could say that in his plan of salvation, you could take that illustration of an architect and builder, for knowledge happens in his mind's eyes as he sees the house before the ground is even broken and the foundation is laid. Predestination perhaps is like the blueprint or the plan that he has put down and follows. Now sometimes we are afraid when we hear these big words and big concepts in the scriptures because we do not understand them. However, we should heed Martin Luther's words when he says, this doctrine is not so incomprehensible as many think, but is rather full of sweet comfort for the, for the elect and all who have the Holy Spirit. And this is the Christian's comfort. Therefore, if you are a Christian this morning, you have to think about this, that long before the creation of the world, God saw you. He loved you. He chose you. He predestined you to be saved. 
He destined us for adoption, as we read in Ephesians 1.5. In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will. He predestined us for His purpose, as we learn in Ephesians 1.11. In Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. And when we look back, then again, I remind you, this is in the context of suffering. And so in the context of suffering, if you should doubt your salvation and wonder why all of these things are going on in your life, you have to look back to what God has already done. And that brings security into the midst of your present sufferings. No matter what you are going through, no matter the despair you might have, or even the doubts I would say, you are secure in God's grace. This is what this teaching means. This is sheer, amazing grace. You can picture it as like a king who sees a peasant maiden and loves her and chooses her out of all the others. Or, or a man who goes to adopt a, from an orphanage, chooses this child and says, you are mine now. You are my son. You are my daughter. Could picture it like that. Yet there is more. Uh, we have amazing comfort in this, but God has done this so that we would be conformed to His Son. His Son. Uh, we read in verse 29 For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. Now, in context, this conformity to His Son has a future aspect to it. We've been talking about the redemption of our bodies. We have been talking about how the sons of God, the children of God, will be revealed. This is what we have been talking about. It refers to the glory that will be revealed to us. So it has that future aspect to it. Um, it's, the Apostle Paul tells the Philippians that the Lord Jesus will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to himself. He tells the Corinthians, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. One day we will truly, fully be conformed to the image of his son. Now in the meantime, we are, that there is a process. There's a pilgrimage as we are being more conformed to the image of his son process called sanctification. This teaching of predestination is not caused to slack off, but to pursue greater Christ-likeness. While we walk through this word, world, this conformity to Christ comes through a process. When God begins His work, He is constantly molding and shaping us. He's constantly refining us so that we look more like Jesus. You know, Ron sang about beginning the service, and, and uh, Jesus becomes sweeter for us. And so when you begin that, you have a, 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 an idea of what Christ has done. But as you walk that path, he, not only does He become sweeter and more precious to you, but you reflect Him more to the people around you. One way God changes us is through the ministry of the Spirit and the Word. The Spirit brings us about as we behold Christ and see Him through His Word. 2 Corinthians 3.18 And we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. God's eternal purpose planned in an eternity past was for us to be more like Jesus. Another way that he does it is through the furnace of suffering. And when we go through suffering, we don't like it. But suffering reveals certain aspects of us that he wants to bring out and he wants to refine. Perhaps it is our patience. Perhaps it is our anger that we are dealing with. Perhaps it is our pride and we need to be more humble. Who knows what it could be in your life? God does. And he brings you through that to work on us and to conform us. Suffering is a part of God's purpose to make us more like Jesus Christ. This is the purpose of, and goal of God in our lives. 
God does not set us set out to make us happy but holy. He does not set out to make us wealthy in this world but to become poor in spirit. He does not set out to make us famous in the world but humble before him. He does not set out to make us successful in this world but to savor the world to come. This is his purpose in our lives. And he does this for the supremacy of his son, the priority of his son. You read at the tail end of verse 29, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Well, what does this mean? Firstborn obviously means, can mean throughout scriptures that it is the first son that is born. But in other contexts, and this is one of them, it means priority or supremacy, that Jesus would have the supremacy. And this is how it is used of him. Though Jesus became like us to redeem us, God's purpose to make us like Christ is so that Christ has the supremacy, the priority. Jesus is the only unique Son of God. Thus, it is not so much about us being glorified as Jesus himself is glorified. In Philippians 2, we read that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. No other name will get that glory. No other name will get that praise but the name of Jesus. He will have the supremacy. He will have the priority in that day. In this day, we pray that he will. In the days to come, he will have that supremacy. You can count on it. And if you have not bowed the knee to him now, if you have not bowed your heart to him now, bow to him now so you can worship him later. Now, even though our Lord Jesus is exalted to the highest place, though he sits at the right hand of the throne of God, he nevertheless calls us brothers, sisters. And this gives us a dignity as well that we should not overlook. He gets all the supremacy. He gets all the glory. Hallelujah, praise his name. But we are called his brothers and sisters. And that should raise our heads in those despairing moments that we have. That should cause our eyes to look to him in wonder and adoration that we are called his brothers. Now, I don't know if you have a brother, or if you have a good brother, or a bad brother, or if, even if you had one. I had a pretty good brother. But he's a brother that is going to be there closer than a friend to you. He's the brother that you can go to in the middle of the night and call him, so to speak. And he'll, he's going to pick up. He's going to be there to walk in your suffering along with you. He's done that, and will do it again with you. Now, I realize that these twin words, foreknow and predestined, might cause some to doubt. Some might question, have I been predestined? How do I know whether God foreknew me and sent my, his affection on me? Old confession of faith, the canons of the Lord said, such assurance comes not by inquisitive searching into the hidden and deep things of God, but by noticing with themselves the un unmistakable fruits of election pointed out in God's word, such as true faith in Christ, a childlike fear of God. Do not probe the depths of God and ask those questions. Instead, pursue Him and pursue Christ's likeness. Now imagine that we were on a safari in Africa, and all of a sudden, we came upon a pride of lions, and they started to lick their chops. I don't know, I'm not gonna sit there and ponder, am I going to be one who is safe, or am I gonna be one of the eaten? I don't know about you, you can do that and stay there and ponder that with the hungry brutes. I'm going to run to the fort that's a mile, a half a mile back, and I hope to see you there. That's what I'm going to do. We can get caught up in those things. But here's the truth. Until you're in the refuge of Christ, if you are in the refuge of Christ, then you are one of the saints. You have been foreknown. You have been predestined. It's meant to encourage you not to cause doubt, not to say, oh, I don't know if I am or not, not to slack off, but to pursue greater Christ's likeness, to pursue him more. So run to him, fly to him, know him. So look back in those times of suffering 
to see God's purpose, the eternal purpose plan, but look now and see God's eternal purpose is applied. We read in verse 30, and those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. And so in the midst of suffering, you look at the now, you look at the present, what God has already done. We have explored the depths of God's eternal purpose plan, namely that he foreknew and he predestined his people. Now as we move along this golden chain of salvation, we will see that God's purpose is applied to us in our present day lives. What God has done in eternity past, he brings to fruition today. In, throughout our history, today, in the present, and until Christ comes. Again, perhaps if you will, God thought of the house uh, is his foreknowledge, the blueprint is the, uh, his predestination, yet the actual outworking, the construction uh, of his eternal purposes accord, occurred today, throughout history. Um, we looked at the phrase last week, according to his, called according to his purpose, and so we must review this word call in its current context this week. This is the next link in the chain, the next link of the golden, on the golden chain. Those whom he predestined, he also called. This comes as a direct result of his foreknowledge and his predestination. Indeed, it cannot be separated from the other two in this golden chain. Now, I mentioned last week what this call is, that theologians sometimes call it as effective or effectual call of God. Well, what does it mean? Now, there is a general call that goes out to all people in the gospel. Jesus says to everyone who hears him, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Here is Jesus. He warns you to repent of your sins. Here is Jesus. He calls you to himself to find rest and satisfy your souls. Here is Jesus, the bread of life, saying, hey, if you're thirsty, if you're hungry, come to me. I will satisfy you. This is the general call that goes out to all. Yet when it says those he called, it refers more to a summons that cannot be denied. This happens when we hear the gospel and the Spirit of God changes our hearts so that we respond to the call of the gospel. Now it is something akin to what happened when Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus. If you know the story, Jesus delayed in coming to the tomb. Much to Martha and Mary's uh, chagrin, uh, dis, dis, uh, dismay, I should say. He came. He even wept at the tomb. And then he got up and he said, roll back the stone. Martha, uh, Lord, he's been dead four days. He stinks. He stinketh, as the King James Version has it. And Jesus, they, they do it, and then Jesus comes to the cave and he calls out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And he did. He got up. He came out of the tomb. The dead man who could not hear, who could not see, who could not feel, heard the call of Jesus, got up out of the tomb, and came out. And this is what happens when the gospel goes forth. And you might have heard the gospel so many times. And yet it, it, it was like water running off of a rock. But then there was a time that it came to you and suddenly everything clicked in your mind and you said, that's it, why didn't I see it before? Jesus is the answer. He is the way, the truth, the life. He is Lord, he is Savior. And this is how this effective call goes. It goes out in the general gospel, but God at some point in history calls you. He says, you are mine. Today is the day of salvation for you. And he changes you from the inside out and you respond and you believe in him. This is grace. This is immense grace that we can rely on, we can trust on in our, our, the most horrible times. As I was thinking about it, it's no good going to a caterpillar and picking it up and throwing it up into the air and say, fly. You can do that, but probably terrify the poor caterpillar. The caterpillar has to go under a tremendous a metamorphosis, a tremendous change. Only then can it fly. 
and we ourselves are dead in our trespasses and sins. But when the call of God and the gospel of Jesus comes to us, he changes us. It's not over a period of time. It's instant. It's immediate. He changes us. We are born again, as the scriptures call it. And that is what must happen. Only then, only then can we fly. Look now what, that God has called you. And look now, God has justified you. And those whom he called, he also justified. Now those of you who have been with us through the study of Romans should know what justified means. It means that God declared you righteous in Christ. This is what it means. <clears throat> Romans deals with this topic of justification by faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone. And the apostle made it abundantly clear in the first three chapters that no one is righteous, no one is good enough, no one is godly enough, no one seeks God, no one fears him. That was his conclusion. We can't make it on our own. Not only that, but we are under the wrath of God. We're in a miserable state. But then, but then we read about the grace of God, how God sent his son Jesus, who was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that we deserve, that, uh, the punishment that fell upon him, I can't quote that right, um, but it went on him, so we don't have to pay it, and by his wounds, we are healed. The punishment that brought us peace fell upon him, that's how it goes, it fell upon him. And when we believe in him, we are declared righteous. He slams the gavel down, he says you are righteous in Christ. This is amazing grace. There is nothing more you can do. There is no sin you can atone for. There is no good work you can do that will pay him off. It's surely by grace. Now I need to pause here for a moment and link this together. If you are a Christian, and this means that sometime, well, it means that you are justified. And that means that sometime in the past, God called you. Maybe you heard it from Billy Graham. Maybe you heard it from your mother. Maybe you heard the gospel on the radio. I don't know how. But it means that at some point the gospel came and you believed. God called you to himself. But then if you look further back, God had predestined you. God had foreknown you. And you are secure in his grace. You are secure in his grace. This is the foundation that you can stand upon. And this has great benefit to us. You know, when you see a loved one have Alzheimer's or dementia or cancer, and they are struggling, and if your loved one was a Christian, that means that your loved one is justified. Your loved one has been called. Your loved one has been predestined. Your loved one has been foreknown from eternity past, and nothing can suffer that chain. No disease, no illness, no sickness. Nothing in heaven and on earth can suffer that chain. That means you are secure in Christ. This is what this means. Or if you are in the midst of despair because of whatever troubling circumstances, you can say, I've been justified. Huh, well that means I've been called. Wow, that means I've been predestined. That means God foreknew me before creation of the world. You see the solid foundation that you can stand upon in those times. This is God's grace that we stand upon. And this means that today, if you stand justified, it means that you will also be glorified, that God will bring you home. And so our final point is look forward. God's eternal purpose is finalized. We read, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. And we note that it is in the past tense, as Christopher Ash put it, although the event itself is future, it is as good as done, because God says it will happen. And here is the finale, here is the culmination that God works toward. For knowledge is his, in his mind's eyes, predestination is the blueprint, the construction is the calling, and the justification, but now the glorification is the completed house, and that will happen when, the day, when Christ shall return. 
And this is why we know that God works all things together for good. And this is why we know that the Apostle Paul's daring claim that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us is true. Because the Christian's final destination is to be glorified. What does it mean that God glorified us? Just this. One day, the Lord Jesus Christ will return. One day, He will come back with the trumpet call of God, with the shout of an archangel. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And we who remain will be changed. We will see Him as He is, and we will be like Him. So I've been reading some biographies. There's one man in particular, Andrew uh, Bonar, an author pastor in the 1800s. And he often told his congregation, you will not recognize me on that day. He recognized his own, <laughs> own state, his own sin, so to speak. But he's like, you're not going to recognize me. I'm going to be different. I mean, I believe that we will recognize each other, but we're going to be different. We're going to be glorified. We're going to have our resurrected bodies. We're not going to have the, the, the sin to deal with. Sin will be eradicated from our lives. We're not going to have our aches and pains anymore. No, no more sickness. No more cancer. Nothing of the, that is going to happen. It is in that holy place in the new heavens and the new earth where God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away, and we will ultimately be like Jesus. In this world wrought with suffering and sickness and problems and pain, let us cast our eyes towards that future glory. Let us remember that one day we will realize that God is our portion. Let us think on the day when sin will no longer hinder us, and the day we will walk with Christ. And so look back at what God has planned in His eternal purpose. Look now what He has already done in your life and look forward to the future and see the grace of God in your life. And this comes to us as comfort. As I've mentioned before, it comes to us as comfort in our sufferings. From eternity past to eternity future, God plan to save you, has saved you, will bring it to fulfillment in the days to come. This means that no matter the pain, no matter the tears, no matter the sorrows, no matter the persecution, God has saved you. It is a closed deal. It is a done deal. This provides comfort and strength in our trials. And this grace, if you really understand it, unites us together. It brings un in unlikely people. It brings in blacks and whites so that they can be united in Christ. It brings, do I dare say it, Republicans and Democrats in Christ. It brings nationalities in Christ. It brings the rich and the poor together because their common ground is the grace in Christ Jesus. Nobody worked for anything in God's plan of salvation. He saves, and He saves alone, through Jesus Christ our Lord. That is grace. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we worship you for the grace that you have given to us. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will have compassion on us. Now, these are big concepts for us to grasp. I pray that we will be humble as we approach them. And marvel at the grace that you give to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have your own books, please turn to...